Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are going to start in one or two minutes uh, because of the waiting room. It is full. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrei Richter. Uh, I'm senior advisor at the OSC Office of the Representative on Freedom of the Media. 
We are about to start the first meeting uh, titled International Law and Policy on Disinformation in the Context of Freedom of the Media. And uh, I, I will pass the microphone to uh, Teresa Ribeiro, who is the representative on freedom of the media. For those of you mostly speakers who are, are not necessarily familiar with the OEC uh, kitchen, uh, Ms. Ribeiro is the fifth representative on freedom of the media. Uh, she has vast political, diplomatic, human rights, and media experience. And prior to this position, she was Secretary of State of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Portugal, while serving as President of the National Commission for Human Rights. Ms. Ribeiro, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you, excellencies, dis distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our expert meeting on what is a timely and important subject, that of tackling the issue of disinformation and its malign influence by crafting effective policies and legislation in line with media freedom commitments. While the issue of disinformation in the media has been around since the birth of journalism itself, the problem is more prevalent than ever in today's digital age. With the rise of internet and social media, disinformation is able to travel across border unchecked, unverified, and at a lightning speed. That is why I have gathered you all here today and why I have made countering disinformation a priority of my office. Because as the British author, Jonathan Swift once said, falsehood flies and truth comes limping after it so that when we came to be undeceived, it is too late. The jest is over and the tale has at its effect. This virtual round table will be the first in a series of expert meetings that seek to address the international problem of how to counteract disinformation in the context of freedom of expression. And I am pleased to be joined today by renowned international experts on the topic. Together, we will examine current international practices as well as examples of international law seeking to limit the harm of disinformation. While there is no universally accepted definition of disinformation, which certainly does not make our job easier, there are some distinguishable characteristics and features. For instance, if we take the Brussels approach as a starting point, disinformation involves verifiably false or misleading information that is created presented and disseminated for economic gain or to intentionally deceive the public and that may cause public harm. Does this include public harm to media freedom, audiences, trust in news media, both traditional and online, rest, rests on their search for accurate and fact-based information? In abiding by the principles of fairness and separation of facts and opinions, journalists build credibility with their audience. Therefore, by blurring the lines between false and true, this information undermines public trust in professional quality journalism and its role in a democratic society. In short, this information seeks to destroy trust in the media and when you destroy trust, you destroy the bonds that hold society together. The need to act is therefore paramount. Only recently, we have witnessed how this information can spread during a global health pandemic and the devastating impact this can have on, economy, on economies and the health of societies. This information also threatens the security that we hold dear in the OSCE, the security that we have worked long and hard to maintain and keep 
uh, psychocyte. This information thrives in regimes where independent investigative journalism is constrained and is probably best tackled through media literacy and with a vibrant, pluralistic and independent media landscape. While this information on its own presence challenges to governments, so too do their responses and the business policies of the media platforms if they fail to respect human rights and freedom of expression. State responses to tackling disinformation are myriad, ranging from measures to disrupt the internet to legislation aimed at de facto censoring, punishing, or restricting dissemination of information and regulation of social media platforms. Let me be clear, however, that in my view, tackling disinformation by restricting human rights is not the way forward. That is why we must ensure respect for international legal frameworks to protect our freedom of expression and opinion, and to name a few, Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which guarantee the right to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers and through any media of one's choice. Crucially, states have a duty to refrain from interfering with these rights. Alongside this, in 2017, my office, together with the Special Rapporteurs on Freedom of Expression and Opinion of the UN, the Organization of American States, and the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, published a joint declaration on freedom of expression and fake news, disinformation and propaganda. Among the general principles contained therein, the declaration especially emphasized that the states may only impose restrictions on the right to freedom of expression in accordance with the test set out in international law, namely that such restrictions be provided for by law, serve a legitimate interest as recognized by international law and be necessary and proportionate to protect that interest. While states have an obligation not to interfere with citizens' right to freedom of expression and opinion, businesses and private companies too must ensure that their policies and practices do not undermine human rights or trust in the public eye, in line with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. After all, the use of new technologies and online platforms has often been exploited to spread harmful and false information for various motives, be they political, ideological or commercial. This has been particularly true during election campaigns. Just last year, my office co-published a joint declaration on freedom of expression and elections in the digital age, expressed alarm at the misuse of social media by both Zoom state it, and private actors to subvert election processes, including through the use of propaganda and denounce the use of disinformation, which can exacerbate and generate election related tensions. The spread and creation of disinformation is further facilitated by the use of artificial intelligence. As you know, my office has developed a project on AI and media freedom, in which we look at how AI and algorithms can be used to detect or counter false news, as well as the ethical standards surrounding the use of artificial intelligence. Indeed, in this era, AI is used more and more as a political tool to dictate what information people see online, 
computers can now even generate such convincing content that people may have a hard time figuring out what's true anymore. This meeting will therefore seek to address all this and other issues and questions with the hope of producing concrete outcomes and recommendations for OSC participating states to implement. To facilitate the discussion, we have already developed a brief on the topic. This paper will stay online on our webpage to be added by further material based on the discussions we have today. The OSC, with its comprehensive approach to security, is the perfect platform to hold a dialogue on the pressing issues surrounding disinformation. I do not know a government within the OSC that would declare its support for disinformation. I hope this will help us all put in place common policies and standards that effectively tackle the spread of disinformation. For if we fail in this endeavor, our societies will be weaker and how human rights will slowly but surely degrade. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ribeiro. Um, I will, as a moderator, I'll say a few words about the procedure of the of this session. Uh, first of all, I would like to note that the session is being recorded and the recording will be then used by the OEC uh, and probably put on the OEC website if the quality permits. Um, we therefore I, I kindly ask um, some of you who has not um, muted your microphone to mute it if you're not speaking. We had already interruptions in the sound during the uh, opening remarks by Ms. Ribeiro. We have uh, basically two panels within one session. Uh, the first panel will be on uh, international law on disinformation. And the second will be on the intergovernmental response to disinformation. And uh, between the sessions, there will be a 10 minute break uh, to let uh, interpreters and uh, others also have a, uh, some rest. Um, I have requested each speaker to talk not more than for 10 minutes. So I, I hope uh, that is short enough and, and long enough to, to bring the point and also not to make everybody bored by the uh, present, long presentations. There will be plenty of time for discussion and questions. Uh, just in advance of, of the session itself, I would like to say that uh, you may send your questions in chat for everyone or, or common chat, and then probably we'll give floor to those who want to raise a question. Um, also, you can, you can do simultaneously or together with that, raise your hand. Um, we can see the screen and, and we can see who raised um, his or her hand uh, in order to give floor uh, for questions or short comments. Uh, but speakers of the sessions can, uh, can talk at any time. I will not uh, ask them to raise hand or to, to do anything in the chat. You, you may interrupt uh, um, or intervene at any point of the discussion. Um, those who want to listen to translation, we have a Russian translation. We have translation from Russian into English. You need an app, uh, a Zoom app, if you have Zoom app. You are fine. If not, then uh, unfortunately you will hear only the um, the mi main microphone. Um, I think that covers all the technical details. If if I missed anything, ah yes, one is another important thing. We uh, aim to end not later than four thirty, but if uh, we we see that uh, there all the questions uh, have been asked and uh, all the comments made, then we we might. Uh, Finish earlier. That's at, le at least the plan for now. Um, at this point, uh, I would like to start the our first session within within the uh, roundtable. We have three uh, professors here, well, actually two professors and one senior research fellow, which is by by many standards is the same as professor. Uh, and uh, yeah, Mark already smiles. I I'm glad to see them uh, on the screens already. Uh, please show yourselves, uh, and I give floor to 
uh, our first speaker. Uh, and we actually will go on uh, in the order as, as in the agenda. Dr. Bjornstern Abade, uh, who is a senior research fellow at Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, I will not read the biographies which are available on the website. I just want to underline that his research today is on very important for us a uh, question of uh, interrelation of law and truth. Uh, Dr. Bade, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I would like to briefly introduce some of the relevant treaty and customary international law before focusing on the concept of disinformation in more detail. International law has addressed false and misleading information for a long time. Already in 1936, the League of Nations drafted the International Convention on the Use of Broadcasting in the Cause of Peace. This broadcasting convention obliges states, among other things, to stop transmissions likely to harm good international understanding by statements, and I quote, the incorrectness of which is or ought to be known to the persons responsible for the broadcast. And it obliges them to publicly correct such statements. In 1953, the United Nations created the Convention on an International Right of Correction. This correction convention gives states a special right to reply to dispatches of news agencies that they consider false or distorted and capable of injuring their relations with other states. Other contracting states are then obliged to distribute this reply. If they don't, the injured state may submit its reply to the Secretary General of the United Nations who shall give appropriate publicity to it. 13 participating states of the OSCE are currently contracting parties to the Broadcasting Convention, six to the Correction Convention. More recently, a debate has begun whether the principle of non-intervention could apply to false or misleading information. This principle, well established in international law, prohibits one state from coercively intervening in the internal or external affairs of another state. States' freedom of choice is hereby protected, for example, from direct or indirect use of force, as the International Court of Justice ruled in the Nicaragua judgment. But can spreading false or misleading information constitute such intervention? Can it be coercive? To my mind, certain false statements could be coercive. They can deprive states of their freedom of choice in the sense that they seek to manipulate decision makers' capacity to reason. Circumstances accepted as fact constrain our freedom. Some options may no longer seem to exist. Others may appear to be inevitable. If a candidate in an election committed a grave crime, people will be inclined not to vote for that person. False information might sometimes achieve its aim even more effectively and with less risk than a threat of armed force. Whether it actually achieves its aim is, for legal purposes, irrelevant since the intervention need not be successful to be prohibited under international law. Whether and to what extent false or misleading information that is spread by a state really violates the principle of non-intervention remains subject to debate among states and scholars. But for example, Germany recently issued a position paper on the application of international law in cyberspace in which it recognized that this information may indeed constitute prohibited intervention, at least in some circumstances. It gave the example that it could cause riots that impede the conduct, the conduct of an election. Now, you might have noticed that I mostly avoided the term disinformation so far. From a legal perspective, the concept of disinformation is problematic because it tends to conflate distinctions that are legally very important. There is, as has already been mentioned, no universally accepted definition of disinformation, but it is mostly agreed that statements can constitute such disinformation, which is intentionally false or misleading. The European Union's definition um, contains these elements as referred. It also contains additional elements, but these are not relevant to the point that I'm trying to make now. Statements that are false or misleading, but not intentionally so, are mostly referred to as misinformation as opposed to disinformation. 
the broadcasting convention, the correction convention, and the principle of non-intervention all apply to false statements. Statements that are misleading are only covered by the correction convention, which expressly refers to distorted statements. Misleading statements are considered disinformation because they are presented in a way which makes it likely that false conclusions are drawn from them. But they differ from false statements because the stated facts are true. The selection, framing, and presentation of facts, however, are value judgments. They cannot be proven to be true or false. For example, if a news outlet chose to truthfully report on each and every person who suffered blood clots after vaccination for COVID-19, this would arguably distort the importance of these very rare cases. It would arguably exaggerate the risks associated with vaccination. But legally, this choice of presentation of true facts must be characterized as an opinion that this presentation is appropriate. Only in rare cases can statements be so distorted as to be considered false. With regard to the principle of non-intervention, it is undisputed that mere criticism of other states and be it biased and unfair is not prohibited under international law. International human rights law, which will certainly be addressed in more detail later today, likewise recognizes that false statements of fact can, in certain restrictive circumstances, be subject to proportionate civil and criminal sanctions. But opinions, in particular on politically sensitive issues, enjoy the highest level of protection, even those that may seem entirely wrong to most people. Another issue with the definitions of dis and misinformation is that they only address intent and lack of intent. In practice, however, the question whether due diligence duties have been complied with is far more prevalent. The Broadcasting Convention also covers statements, the incorrectness of which ought to be known. Journalists who diligently researched a factual statement before publication may not be sanctioned even if the statement later turns out to be false. More can be required of journalists in this regard than of other citizens, but not so much that lawful reporting becomes unreasonably difficult. Taking these shortcomings of the definition of disinformation into account, I would submit that special attention should be paid to its constituent elements and other as aspects not covered by the minimalist core definition I present here. Legally, we should talk about and note the differences between intentionally and unintentionally false and misleading statements, the effects of purpose and associated duties of due diligence. Finally, it should be noted that the concept of fake news, which arguably covers the same types of statements, is rejected by many scholars and also by the European Union, primarily because people like the last president of the United States chose to use this concept to deflect criticism, whether it's well-founded or not. The point I would like to make is that the concept of disinformation can be abused in the very same manner, but so could any concept that refers to the phenomenon described, no matter how you name it. Since 2016, disinformation has again come to be perceived as a great threat to societies, to their political process and their capacity to respond to crises such as the current pandemic. This development has contributed to a certain shift in the way media regulation is perceived. For a long time, a general trend toward decriminalization and less state intervention seemed clear. Now, stronger regulation is also advocated for. A proportionate response that respects human rights is certainly called for, but history and more recent experience show that you need to take into account the possibility that such regulation might be abused by state actors, but also by private actors to stifle free exercise of freedom of speech. The more recent case law of the European Court of Human Rights on Article 18 of the European Convention, which addresses the misuse of human rights restrictions, confirms this danger. Even regulations that are, abstractly speaking, unproblematic may be applied in an, in an abusive manner in individual cases. The importance of independent courts and safeguarding against such abuse cannot be overstated. 
It must be emphasized in this regard that any action taken against this information must not infringe on the legitimate role of journalists to impart information of public concern to the public. Moreover, states have a duty to protect journalists from unlawful attacks, no matter where they come from. In my opinion, it is most important to foster an information environment that allows citizens to trust in sources of information because they know that this trust is justified. In modern societies, no one can form their convictions about reality without trusting in the integrity of others. Building and maintaining trust to counter disinformation is one of the most important challenges for the media, but also for state institutions. Legal measures can be a part of this answer to disinformation, but ultimately trust cannot be legally mandated. It must be earned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, the questions will come after the panel, uh, and I already have several. Uh, but the floor will be given now to uh, Dr. Trisha Meyer, who is Assistant Professor of Digital Governance and Participation at the Brussels School of Governance of the uh, Free University in Brussels. Uh, she is also the leader of Research Center for Digitalization, Democracy, and Innovation. And uh, her research uh, topic, uh, her research interest currently is governance of uh, platforms. Trisha, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I even got a little bit of my bio read. I feel I feel quite privileged. Um, <laughs> so in, in the context of this panel, I will be talking somewhat about the self-regulatory and the de facto role that platforms play currently in the international landscape. Um, and um, I think it's important to take this uh, status quo or this de facto role that they play into account in discussions in order to understand how things are currently ongoing, uh, but also uh, to reflect on, on possible solutions. Now I have to advance, there we go. Um, so I like to start with, uh, uh, it's an American scholar, Lawrence Lessig's uh, pathetic dot uh, theory. Um, and in particular, because uh, what we uh, are reflecting on if we think of disinformation in the online landscape is whether we are regulating and seeking to uh, solve a problem through use of technology in part, uh, or whether we're actually reflecting at times about the regulation of the technology itself and the architecture that allows for particular um, trends to, to, to be amplified. Um, and I, I really uh, appreciate the remarks from uh, the, the OECE representative in the beginning to note that this is a complex issue. Um, and I think this this theory points to that as well, that uh, each problem has uh, multiple causes, but also multiple solutions. And so while my presentation focuses on the role that the architecture in this particular figure, so the technology, the online platforms can play both as a problem and a solution, um, I think it's very important to note that there are multiple ways to go about this and that there's interactions between those. Um, so at a European level, but also um, in, in, in many places across the world, there's a, a grappling and trying to seek how from a legal perspective we can deal with disinformation. And often the role of platforms is emphasized in that. Um, that is correct, but at the same time, I think we need to have a larger perspective to understand what are the causes of disinformation, uh, and in particular that the platforms often are distribution means. Uh, they are not producing uh, the disinformation, but at the same time, they do. Uh, they are that bottleneck where you can deal with some of these, these issues. Um, and so in particular, I'll be looking at some of the opportunities and the challenges of uh, the use of technology technology to deal with disinformation and, and therefore the de facto role that these platforms play. Um, and uh, this was also already quoted, Article 19 of the UN Declaration. Um, I won't reread it, but I will um, emphasize that there are these international standards that are, that are set out for, for any restrictions that we have to freedom of expression and, and, and 
and uh, opinion. Um, and in particular, that that should provide a rationale whenever proposing new legislation, uh, whether that is uh, to, to restrain certain actions of online platforms or for disinformation, which uh, disinformation in, in its nature, nature is dealing both with illegal content, but also harmful content. And what we notice is that there's increasingly this desire to also look at harmful content um, and harmful content, um, you do need to look at the victims and the consequences that it has. Um, in particular, here in this context, uh, reflecting on uh, what kind of restraints are being made to the freedom of expression, how freedom of ex uh, expression can be used as as a as a tool, uh, abused as a tool, really, um, to to restrict the freedoms of of others, whether that's minorities or journalists, uh, political activists, etc., um, and whether the action that is being taken would actually uh, match these international standards. We also have to think of that in the regulation of technology itself, whether what we're doing is measured, whether what we're doing is proportionate really to the problem that we're, that we're dealing with, or whether it's being used as a vehicle for restraining speech in other ways. Um, I'm building on two sets of work that I've done. Uh, one is uh, my contributions to a UNESCO ITU Broadband Commission report, uh, the Balancing Act um, on countering disinformation while respecting freedom of expression. Uh, it is quite a volume of work <laughs> where we map up a multitude of various types of responses to disinformation. Uh, my work focused primarily on um, the role that platforms play, and I'll be presenting a little bit on, on my work on curatorial responses. Uh, at the same time, I'm involved with a project with uh, a civil society organization here in Brussels called EU Disinfo Lab, where they're monitoring COVID-19 disinformation responses of platforms. So the analysis that I've uh, been been focusing on really in the last year is a mapping and a monitoring and an analysis of the curatorial responses, the platform responses, uh, as outlined uh, in terms of service community guidelines, editorial policies of, of platforms. Uh, in the UNESCO ITU report, I looked at a whole diversity, uh, a really global um, uh, social media platforms, also non-Western ones more recently uh, for, for language restrictions in part I've been focusing on the, on the big uh, Western platforms Facebook Twitter Google um, um, and um, so here I'd like to give you a little bit of a snapshot of the responses that they've had to two types of disinformation in 2020 COVID-19 uh, so health disinformation, and then uh, because it's gotten a lot of attention, the US um, uh, elections, uh, so political disinformation. And what strikes me with uh, US election disinformation is that um, the platforms were eager, um, uh, they, they kind of had to react, but the, the elections are ongoing every day across the world. <laughs> um, and so the question also thereby is, why was their reaction so much stronger at, in that particular case, um, um, and 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 is that not necessarily uh, um, in other places, unless the country the uh, really has kind of forced them? Uh, Canada has done that, India has done that, the EU during its elections, etc. Um, but but why is it as well that we noticed that they took more action in the U.S.? I think everyone has <laughs> has. The answer, but it, it still is striking. Um, so a little bit on 2020 disinformation, and this is the this is the answer. But I'll I'll go on to my next slide, which is uh, might provide a more visual on this. Um, so we noticed that there was a very strong emphasis on. Um, disinformation on on amplifying authoritative uh, uh, content that's the fourth line that you see there uh, both in the context of c that's covid or e uh, elections um, there was a lot of kind of giving more voice to particular uh, uh, actors uh, in the case of COVID-19, health authorities, uh, in the case of, uh, of, of elections in the US, it was then uh, sources of information about uh, kind of how the elections were going to take place, not necessarily the candidates themselves, um, uh, but an amplification of particular types of what they define as authoritative content. Um, um, 
there's at the same time uh, you see an increase as well in the blocking the removing the limiting of of, of content um, and what's important to note here is that um, a lot of this was specific to their advertising policies uh, so there was really kind of a, in both cases a broadening of uh, so take for instance twitter's definition of of harmful content in order to be able to take action so they are very much using their uh, policies in order to um, be able to, to take action, whether that's legal or what they have defined as being acceptable on their, on their platforms. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with that just as the very brief snapshot right now in order to uh, be able to talk a little bit about what I see the are the challenges as well as uh, if I have time a little bit of the, the recommendations, but I can come back to that later as well. So what we really know notice is that in 2020, they took unprecedented measures to minimize harm uh, not just legal, illegal, but harm uh, through content. And in part, uh, uh, they started to also look at uh, account uh, moderation. These uh, updates sometimes were clearly planned. Uh, we noticed, for instance, how uh, uh, manipulated content gets dealt with more, uh, especially on Twitter, but also Facebook. But some of them were knee-jerk reactions. Um, uh, the, 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 the ultimate uh, measure really was the deplatformization of, of, of uh, former President Trump. Um, and what we notice here is really that they uh, have they have global reach and in currently an uncoordinated matter because there aren't rules that really apply to them. Uh, they are defining and enforcing what is acceptable speech. And I think from a freedom of expression per, uh, perspective, that is something really to be attentive uh, to. There are no uh, um, harmonized standards or definitions right now. And so they're determining their own yardstick. Often there's also very little appeal uh, or revision measures, very little transparency and accountability. Um, and that really leads me to kind of uh, think of and building on uh, some of the work as well that the, again, the representative uh, referred to, the UN, uh, uh, the former UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, David Kay, has done some amazing work also looking at uh, what kind of human rights principles we should have for content moderation um, and building on that and some of the work that I've done. Um, I think it's important when we're reflecting on disinformation, in particular when we're looking at re regulation of platforms uh, that we need to focus less on what is acceptable content and more on how are they determining what is acceptable content, how are they determining how they're going to intervene uh, uh, with content as well. So we need measurable content uh, moderation policies, uh, transparent uh, uh, policies in order that we know very specifically uh, with far more uh, granularity that we currently have what type of content are they taking down? Why did they take action? Uh, what kind of accounts are being suspended? Um, what are they promoting? What are they demoting? Uh, so that there's there's knowledge uh, of this. And that also allows to kind of uh, see where the problems lie. I do not think the solution is in telling them uh, in a very strict form, this is the type of content that you can have. Yes, in terms of illegal content, uh, but in terms of harmful content, we also have to allow um, for uh, the speech that that we perhaps don't consider um, um, desirable, um, um, but nonetheless are, are legal. Um, um, and then the second part of this is really to a look beyond that at the empowerment of users. Media literacy was already mentioned, uh, but I think it is incredibly important to look uh, and to consider how we can be training people that they can have a better understanding of what is disinformation, that there is this role to play for the individual as well before they click share, um, uh, before they believe something to also be able to look at those sources. And the platforms have a role to play in kind of highlighting the options that there are, but also in uh, uh, providing the, a variety of, 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 of content. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now, and I'm really looking forward to, to, to our discussion. I hope that this is kind of a useful uh, perspective of some of the uh, current the status quo in this field, uh, in particular when it comes to uh, platform platforms actions uh, and how that impacts freedom of expression. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. Uh, and also, particular thank you for your recommendations and uh, 
uh, I will actually ask each of the speakers uh, during the discussion, uh, those who have not provided yet recommendations or will not provide recommendations in their presentation, if they could come up with uh, ad hoc recommendations to inter intergovernmental organizations uh, such as OSCE on what should be done or what can be done actually. Uh, I, I pass the floor to uh, Dr. Marko Milanovic, uh, who is a professor of public international law at the University of Nottingham School of Law in UK, uh, who is also the co-editor of the blog on, of the European Journal of International Law. Uh, he is also an associate of the Belgrade Center for Human Rights in Serbia. And um, his work, his previous work uh, was, um, has been cited um, in particular by the judges of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, UK Supreme Court, um, Constitutional Court of Serbia, where he um, assisted uh, in, in, in its work. And uh, there are many, many more things to, to, to say about uh, Mr. Um, Milanovic, uh, but uh, I will just pass the floor to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andre, for the introduction, and thank you for having me. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be with all of you here, and, and thank you very much also to the OSC, obviously, and to the representative. Um, so I, um, I, I, what I, I want to talk to you about really is, is, is international law standards that apply to, to, to mis- or disinformation. And uh, my work on this topic is part of a uh, of a report that I have been working on together with Professor Philippa Webb of King's College London that will come out in September uh, under the auspices of the high-level panel on media freedom that was convened by the British and Canadian governments and is co-chaired by, by Lord Newberger and Amal Clooney. And uh, so that is a very extensive report around some 40,000 words that, that, that deals sort of with criminal law and media regulation aspects. And as I said, that will be forthcoming in September. Um, so, um, what does international law have to say on this topic? Well, to, to start answering that question, the, the first question we need to ask is who is spreading misinformation or disinformation? Is it a state or is it a non-state entity? So the who question is really central to how international law understands this topic because international law is a state-centric regulatory system. And let me start first with uh, state misinformation or disinformation. So misinformation or disinformation spread by a state is actually way more powerful, vastly more harmful than non-state misinformation. That is what we normally think of when we use these terms. If you think of the harms done by the spreading of false speech, they're amplified tenfold, a hundredfold when this is done by a state official, especially if it's a high level state official uh, who has a, a prominent media platform. That type of misinformation, disinformation can be directed either against the state's own population, which is the most common sort of posture, or, and this is the legally more difficult problem, against the population of some other state. So let me first deal with the example of the state spreading misinformation against its own population. Uh, in 2019, the Oxford uh, Internet Institute uh, uh, conducted a survey uh, and it found evidence of organized social media manipulation uh, in 70 countries uh, where such operations were executed either by government agencies or by political parties who were in control essentially of the state. And in three quarters of these examples, these were intense Additional manipulative uh, campaigns. Such campaigns can, for example, take the place of troll farms, um, uh, whose purpose is to manipulate public opinion or to intimidate journalists or political opponents, to suppress voting, spread fake information about elections, or as we have seen most recently, uh, we can have state officials spreading misinformation, disinformation about public health issues, for example, about the COVID 19, 19 pandemic the harm that has been done to public health by presidents, by high level state officials, like for example, Mr. Trump or Mr. Bolsonaro in Brazil is again, much higher than anything that is done organically by non-state actors on social media platforms. 
And as you know, this has taken, for example, uh, uh, place um, by way of say misrepresenting the numbers of people infecting by downplaying the the impact of the pandemic by spreading false information about the effectiveness of public health measures such as masking or vaccines by promoting fake cures. Uh, a, a very interesting example, if you want to look at one, uh, is the example of Tanzania where the the government of, of President Magufuli essentially completely controlled the media landscape and on the one hand prevented doctors from speaking about the, the spreading of COVID in Tanzania and on the other hand promoted false cures. Uh, uh, Mr. Magufuli himself died ironically from COVID two months ago. So this kind of state misinformation which does not necessarily have to be intentional, it does not have to be disinformation, can still violate international law. It can in particular violate international human rights law by violating the freedom of opinion of the citizens, is effectively denying them their autonomous ability to make decisions, to make up their own mind, by violating the freedom of expression, in particular the component of the freedom of expression, which protects everybody's freedom to seek and receive information, in presumably an accurate in, 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 uh, accurate information in a, in a non-polluted information space. And it can also violate other human rights, such as the right to health, the right to life, the right to participate in public affairs. So state misinformation, state disinformation is a huge issue, uh, as you can see, uh, uh, when it is directed against the state's own people. But we know several examples or several allegations, at least, where such misinformation, disinformation campaigns have been mounted by states against the population of some other state. And here the legal position is less clear. So uh, Bjorn talked about, for example, the rules of non-intervention and sovereignty, which may come into play. Such information, such misinformation campaigns can also potentially violate human rights law, but there's a specific problem here, which is to what extent international human rights law applies extraterritorially to harms caused to harm caused to people outside the state's border. Um, so we can talk about this more in the discussion if you'd like me to, but uh, there, there are many, many competing views on this whole extraterritoriality issue. Then we come to misinformation, disinformation spread by non-state actors, normal individuals, corporations, hacker groups, you name it. Here the issue is what must the state do and what can it do to regulate such the, the spreading of misinformation, in, in, in essence, to curb the harms caused by that kind of misinformation. The state may indeed have the obligation to act. Each state has the positive due diligence obligation to protect its own people from harm to their rights, their, their specific human rights, such as the right to life, the right to health. And so the state actually has a positive obligation to combat the harms caused by such misinformation. The issue is how can the state do this without infringing unduly on human rights, such as the freedom of expression. So that's the, the key issue. How can the state limit speech that is not true without again, unduly violating the freedom of expression? As the representative mentioned, we do have human rights jurisprudence on, on, on you know, that, that's very, very well developed on justif justifiable restrictions on free speech. We require any such restrictions to be provided by law to pursue a legitimate aim and to be necessary and proportionate to that aim. There is a vast jurisprudence internationally on defamation, which is a specific type of false speech, right? So that is every state has a defamation law and there are mountains of international case law on defamation in particular. But there is a very, very little international case law on mis or disinformation outside that type of context. Uh, and so in the report I mentioned that that, that will be, 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 be forthcoming in September, we have really tried to develop by analogy the various standards that, that should apply in this particular context. The key problem here conceptually is whether the state should be in the business of regulating false speech. On the one hand, you, you have the very liberal kind of ideology of free speech, which says the state should not be the arbiter of truth, there should be a marketplace of ideas where you know, the false, fa false ideas will meet true ideas and the truth will win out in the end. On the other hand, we know that 
marketplaces, including those of ideas, can fail, they can be manipulated by power, by money, and that in fact, truth does not always win over lies. Many of us have lived in countries or societies where lies have been winning for a very, very long time. So this, this, this sometimes very Western notion that the state should never regulate false speech is I think uh, uh, not, not really the right approach in, 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 in international human rights law. States can regulate speech on the basis of the falsity, but there are huge dangers in them doing so. And the main danger is that the state regulation will actually become an excuse for suppressing opposition, for suppressing criticism of the government, for suppressing dissent. We have conducted a, a, a large survey of state practice in recent years, and we have found that really there are two main tools that states have been using to combat misinformation so far. One tool, the bluntest tool, if you will, the most dangerous one, is the repression of false speech by means of criminal law. And particularly during the COVID pandemic, more states have been enacting criminal law punishing speech. And the issue is how can that be done? Uh, I mean, as you, as you can understand, criminal laws, which have such terrible consequences for individuals, potentially such huge chilling effects on free speech require the most substantial amount of justification possible. And the other big tool that states have resorted to for a long, long time is media regula regulation that can take place um, that, you know, that, that has many different guises. Um, there is a long tradition, certainly in Europe, of self-regulatory, co-regulatory, and state regulatory systems of media regulation, which, for example, impose accuracy standards on the media. And in principle, those are justified. The big challenge today, the one that Trisha talked about, is that of, of how to regulate the new landscape of online media, especially social media. Um, that said, there have been numerous contexts in which we have been reasonably comfortable with states regulating speech on the basis of falsity. Every state, for example, has laws against fraud. Every state has laws on false advertising. Every state has laws on perjury. So in, in principle, we can regulate speech on the basis of, of falsity. The issue is how can that be done in a way that causes more good than harm? And let me just say a, a very, very few brief points on that. In our survey of state practice, we have seen that the biggest problem really are those laws, especially criminal laws that are vague, that do not define, for example, the nature of the false speech or do not define the actual harm that is caused by the, 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 the false speech. That same problem exists in the online domain too, you may have seen, for example, the recent decisions of the Facebook Oversight Board, which instructed Facebook to adopt clearer, more transparent policies on content moderation. So that's sort of the issue of vagueness, the prescribed by law idea. Our second point regards the legitimate aim of speech restrictions. Here, my key message is this. States do not have any business in regulating speech simply because it's false. States can only regulate false speech if it causes concrete specific harms to individuals. For example, harms to health. A law that simply seeks to protect the truth, the truth say about past historical events, you know, a number of states have such laws, are in principle not justifiable under international human rights law. Only a law that seeks to prevent specific harms to individuals or to wider society can be legitimate. The biggest danger here is actually when states act with ulterior purposes. A law, as Bjorn was saying, a law that in the abstract looks fine is actually being abused. So you have seen, for example, recently how in India, which is now up in flames due to the pandemic, uh, uh, various state authorities at the federal level and at the level of federal states have been prosecuting people or initiating legal proceedings against them, for example, by, because they have said that there is not enough oxygen in the hospitals or that the state has not done enough to protect them. So essentially the state is really trying to suppress criticism. So that type of, of law that purports to, protect, to, 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 to regulate speech on the basis of its falsehood, but is really trying to suppress dissent 
is categorically impermissible under human rights law. And finally, when it comes to necessity proportionality issues, here I would simply uh, in, endorse some of the comments made before and say that actually what the state must do is promote accurate information, create an environment that enables people, people to, of their own mind, uh, uh, acquire accurate information to promote digital literacy before it can resort to any measures that res restrict speech. If it does resort to measures restrict restricting speech, the key international standard is that the determinations of truth and falsity should never be in the hands of the executive. They should always be in the hands of either independent court or an independent regulator. So if you want a bad example, a bad example, for example, would be the Fake News Act in Singapore called POFMA, which allows ministers to issue binding directives to social media platforms simply because the media, the, the minister has determined that the social, uh, uh, the, the digital platform has promoted uh, uh, false information. Finally, when it comes to criminal laws, criminal laws can only be justified with very high causal and culpability requirements to prevent very specific serious harms to human beings. For example, it can in principle be justified to put somebody in prison if they are knowingly intentionally spreading in false information about false cures for COVID-19 that causes harm to, to, to uh, specific uh, people. It, on the other hand, will not be necessary in proportion to have a criminal law that effectively stops got the government and the government's measures on handling the pandemic from being criticized. So I will, I will end there again, very much looking forward to any further discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, we look forward to, to, to the uh, report, forthcoming report in September, you said it will be published. And uh, uh, as you know, this is the first in a series of seminars and uh, maybe by the end uh, of, of the series, we can have a, a more general discussion and the report will be uh, hopefully one of the instruments used during the discussion on, on the whole issue of uh, disinformation regulation and, um, and countering disinformation in the region. Uh, I, I ask all the speakers to be alert to the chat, to the chat that we are that we all are having, and uh, because uh, we already have the first question uh, from João Marecos, if my Portuguese is is correct, uh, uh, and uh, I would ask uh, Mr. Marecos, who I understand uh, collaborates with the World Health Organization, to uh, put his question himself, if possible. If not, I will read the read the question for the convenience of everybody. Mr. Marekos. Okay, uh, to save time, uh, maybe I ask uh, the three speakers because I think the question is to all of them to um, uh, ask this particular question if possible. Any one of you or all of you? Just unmute yourself, just unmute yourself. <laughs> don't, don't, don't speak without, without microphone. Maybe uh, just start um, with some initial remarks. Um, that is a very interesting question to what extent digital platforms, which are private entities can be bound by human rights obligations. Um, directly, they are not bound. Human rights obligations do only um, uh, are only imposed for state actors. But um, we have been having precisely this discussion in Germany too, because human rights can have an indirect effect between private entities. And the question is always to what extent. Um, in media law, a classical um, constellation is when media companies publish um, certain statements about a private individual, you have the right to um, privacy um, that is colliding with um, the right to freedom of expression. And what we have a similar constellation here, but the question I think is to what extent should um, such digital 
companies, such private entities be bound. And the common conception is, I think, that they shouldn't be bound to the same extent as a state. It cannot be that they have to comply with exactly the same standards as a state would, but maybe they could be bound to some uh, minimal standards at least, that they may not exclude arbitrarily certain persons from a platform, for example, or that they may not arbitrarily take down certain statements. And I think this would be the correct approach, which has also been um, the approach that the Facebook Oversight Board basically took. They applied human rights law um, based on the uh, Ruggie principles. And um, I think this should be, yeah, what um, should be the right way. Thank you. Um, Perhaps we'll, we'll go in order <laughs> of us having spoken. Um, uh, my, my caveat, which I didn't say at the beginning, uh, but I had already told told the panel is I am not an international uh, legal scholar. I'm a media scholar. Um, <laughs> so I'm not pro providing legal comments here, but um, I certainly can speak from the perspective of having reflected on how social media platforms are similar, but also dissimilar to traditional media. We have uh, obligations uh, additional obligations that we give to uh, media, uh, a responsibility to, to, to provide truthful information, diverse information, uh, uh, information that will, will inform. Um, um, and, and similarly, you can reflect on how social media platforms have become the public sphere, uh, uh, kind of the platform where we're debating, um, um, where we're gathering news, where we're understanding what's going on in the world and, 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 and who we should vote for, etc. So there, there certainly is a role to play, albeit uh, 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 different. And in that, um, kind of linking back to the recommendations uh, that I gave, I think it's really important to recognize their di distribution role um, and how there are ways that we need to reflect on how uh, uh, harmful content or illegal content as disinformation uh, is uh, promoted, whether that's through their advertising policies, uh, um, uh, through the way that the algorithms are set up to, 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 to provide you with more content that you like or content that they believe uh, uh, might be viral. Um, but in particular, that we have to think of the transparency in all that we're doing. Um, and that already, um, rather than uh, giving them additional responsibility to be the arbiter of what is truthful, but rather to be transparent, and then to have mechanisms for appeal, which I think has to, you need uh, uh, possibilities to go through a, a court system, or, I mean, the intermediary can be this, this, this quasi public body like the Facebook oversight board sort of is, but I would say it has to go beyond that. That was kind of the last point that I didn't talk about these social media councils of having things beyond just the platforms and that truly are multi-stakeholder, um, but then still having that way of, of kind of appealing uh, when you believe that there's systemically something going wrong in the way that they are, are, are dealing with speech. Um, so indirect response to, <laughs> to that question is, I really think uh, we can't emphasize enough how transparency is needed. Additional accountability, yes, but not for them to go ahead and, 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 and tell people who can be deplatformed de uh, based, on, based on particular statements. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mr. Milanovic. So I, I, I would in, endorse what my, 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 my predecessors have said, and I will just add the following. The more a company such as a digital platform, enjoys a monopolistic position in a certain environment. Think, for example, Facebook, where Facebook is the internet in many countries. The more, it, more, the more appropriate it becomes to impose slightly adjusted human rights obligations on that type of company, the more appropriate it is for that company to internally self-regulate by using the language of human rights law. Now, yes, it's true that the language of human rights law, the rules of human rights law have been designed for states, but that language is also sufficiently flexible in order to enable some of these standards to be applied mutatis mutandis to, to companies. A company can meaningfully, for example, go through the whole process of 
prescribed by law? Do we have transparent, clear internal rules? Are we pursuing a legitimate aim? Is our speech restriction necessary and proportionate? The company can have due process and safeguards of the kind that Trisha was talking about. So yes, I mean, we are not, we're not talking about copy pasting you know, rules made for states to companies, but that can be done reasonably and with sufficient amount of adjustment. Uh, let me also add that uh, Facebook is not only the internet in, in many countries, it's also the media in many countries, or the mass, even the mass media in many countries, uh, which makes the problem even more complicated. Um, just for the speakers to understand, uh, when we have questions, there are three capital letters usually at the beginning, which means that the, the, this person represents delegation of, 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 of a country. So as you can understand, the majority of the speakers, if you look at the screen with, with all the speakers, are representing delegations at the OECE. Uh, and uh, we have the next question from delegation of uh, Great Britain or UK. Uh, uh, Alan Campbell, would you like to, to voice your question yourself? Or... Yes, yeah. please, if, if that's OK. Um, I mean, I have to say it's a really fascinating discussion, and particularly for delegates like myself who don't have the level of detailed knowledge which uh, your, the speakers have. Um, and covering that that depth, I think, is really interesting. I, I was struck by some of the comments which Mr. Milanovic was making about, you know, what the legal structure should be like, um, and uh, and the, the importance of if you're taking action, it should be about harms, and that uh, made me question: What do we mean by harm? Uh, harm to individuals, harm to groups, harms to societies, harm to ways of governance. What should we be considering when we're thinking about such harm, uh, both the types and the level uh, of harm, which would justify some form of intervention at a state level? And then maybe linked to that is, uh, again, picking up on Mr. Milanovic's point, what, what is it that we need to do to make sure that whatever we put in place, the legislation is indeed proportionate in terms of who is actually uh, implementing it? I think we talked about you know, it shouldn't be the objective, and you gave the example of, I think, Singapore. Uh, how, how should we make sure that's an intrinsic part of whatever we try to put in place at an international or a domestic level? Thank you. Yeah, uh, Mr. Milanovic, please. Uh, yeah, thank you. That, that's an excellent question. So when it comes to the, the harm issue, um, I mean, the, the, the starting point here is actually when you look at the, the provisions of, 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 of international human rights treaties that, that protect the freedom of expression, for example, Article 19 of the ICPR, Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights, you will see they have closed lists of legitimate aims uh, uh, for the purpose of which states may limit speech. Some of these aims are, for example, very broadly framed, the rights and reputations of others. You know, that's a very broadly stated aim public order is a very broadly stated aim. In our report, we have looked at state practice and, and um, uh, we have come essentially to the following conclusion, that only a very small subset of all possible harms can warrant regulation by means of criminal law, which is the most dangerous type of regulation. Uh, that's uh, speech, false speech that incites to violence, false speech that causes directly other types of harms to human health and life. So for example, false from the promotion of false cures about COVID. You know? uh, somewhat more difficult to justify, but still sort of in the same ballpark, false speech that directly incites hatred and discrimination. For example, uh, incites hatred against particular ethnic groups. And finally, and most problematically, probably, and certainly the most open to abuse, the uh, false speech that directly undermines democratic processes such as elections. In fact, many countries have such laws. I, I think we have representatives of Canada on the call. Canada actually has some reasonably, you know, the Canada Elections Act, if, if, you, if you look at that act, has some really nice, re re reasonably clearly defined offenses uh, that, for example, punish uh, the, the, the spreading of false information that 
a candidate in the election has died or has withdrawn. You know, uh, that type of very specifically defined uh, 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 false information. The UK has a very old law that, for example, punishes the, 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 the um, false statements about a person's character in a very sort of vaguely defined way. Um, so, you know, that, that is sort of the, the, the harms we have focused on. Uh, everything else is, I think, would be much more difficult to justify, certainly in the criminal law sphere. But my main point, remember, is this. Simply protecting the truth is not a good reason enough. It has to be a specific harm to the concrete interest of you know, a specific human being or even the wider society, such as public health. Thank you. Uh, I see that uh, one of the speakers from the second part of the session is uh, impatient and want, wants to jump in. <laughs> so Ms. Uh, Gulmen, please uh, say what you wanted to say. Yeah, hi, thank you very much. Um, I just want to, just a quick reaction um, uh, to uh, the excellent presentations that have been made, but in particular the point that um, Dr. Milanovic uh, just made um, around incitement. Um, one of the questions um, I wonder is, you know, whether there is a real need for a specific law on disinformation whenever it relates to incitement to violence, because the concept of incitement under international human rights law uh, is not really uh, related to whether or not the information is false. It could be true. Um, so ultimately, what we're really talking about is applying existing laws uh, in a lot of states to um, evolving situations, um, as we may have seen in in, in countries uh, in several countries where information is disseminated that leads to violence. Thank you very much. If I can react just very quickly, I completely agree with that. So certainly when it comes to the incitement of, of uh, violence, hatred, discrimination, existing laws, either on incitement to violence or an incitement to criminal offenses or uh, various modes of hate speech should suffice. There is no need for criminal laws that are specific to misinformation. Where there have been criminal laws that are specific to information, for example, many states have laws, including Serbia, where I'm broadcasting to you from, have laws, for example, that prohibit the dissemination of false information that causes panic or fear in the public. And that is you know, very open to abuse, but it can also be applied to re relatively narrowly. And Serbian courts have reasonably done that. They have adopted narrowing uh, constructions, interpretations of that law saying, there needs to be a particularly high threshold of fear that is actually caused in the public, and that type of offense would then be, by and large, okay. Uh, the the context, you know, of of COVID misinformation, health related misinformation, election misinformation is is more peculiar uh, than than the incitement to violence or hatred that will be already covered by existing rules. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Let me, uh, I, I have many questions. I, I, this new question just appeared, so uh, let, uh, I'll, I'll give you a minute to, to read it. Uh, but I have a question, uh, I have many questions, but I have uh, first questions to Mr. Bader, Dr. Bader. Um, I'll, I'll put three questions. You don't have to reply to the first two if, if, if you don't want to, because they are very existential. First of all, since you research uh, legal viewpoint on truth, uh, is there actually truth from the legal viewpoint uh, for, for, for a legal scholar? But I, as I said, you don't have to reply to that. Second question, you raised a number of legal problems, but are there legal solutions to these problems? Uh, again, you don't have to reply, but we would appreciate if you can help us. And the third question, which is practical, and, and uh, I request you to reply, you, you spoke uh, about two international conventions, broadcasting convention, as you called it, and uh, convention on international right of reply. Both are if formally effective conventions. And both, uh, um, a number of OEC participating states are signatories to the conventions. Uh, why 
they don't work? Why don't they work? Why they are not effective? Uh, is there a, 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 an answer from a legal scholar on the reasons of it? Thank you very much. Thank you for these questions. Um, yeah, it, it's a fair question to ask uh, for uh, truth. <laughs> what is truth if I'm looking into uh, questions of law and truth? Um, there are, of course, various philosophical questions that um, are involved with this concept, but for the law, usually, at least in the areas that I had a look into, the um, concept of truth is um, of factual truth is quite clear. Factual truth means the correspondence of a statement with reality. So if I'm sitting here now, that's the truth. If I'm not, then that wouldn't be. Um, a different question, of course, is normative truth. So what's the right interpretation of um, proportionality of measures, for example? And in that regard, the question, uh, the answer isn't that clear. So um, there is certainly, when it comes to normative questions, a certain leeway to that states have. I mean, we are discussing these questions here and um, um, th th certain, there's certainly clear limits at the ends, but um, th the law certainly doesn't give this one right answer. So there isn't this one right um, criminal law that your state ought to have. There's a, a margin of appreciation in that regard. But we are concerned, of course, with factual truths now. And um, how can the law um, really deal with that? Are there legal solutions? Um, as um, the other panelists have also mentioned, there are certainly various options that um, um, yeah, that, that are possible. And um, the question is how effective can they be? And I would agree that in, the law can play a part. It can play a restrictive part when it comes to repressive sanctions. Um, it has to be narrowly focused on uh, achieving legitimate aims that strike a fair balance between um, the legitimate aim pursued and the um, human rights that is restricted. But the general problem, I think, here is that if you, uh, the, the more effective the legal response tries to be, the more problematic it will be from a human rights point of view. Uh, the, the broader it is, the more kinds of disinformation it covers, the stronger the penalties are, the more problematic it will be. So the law cannot be the ultimate solution of it all. Um, but of course, you can also think of transparency um, and, um, um, yeah, in particular, duties of transparency that media have to show where their funding is from or that social media companies need to show who paid for certain advertisements so that the people who get addressed by these media and advertisements can better assess themselves if they want to trust these statements or not. So to enable citizens to deal with the complex information environment that we have. So transparency duties could be, I think, um, one part of it. But the most important thing I would say is that states have to, states or the media in general too, have to address the concerns and doubts of citizens. If there is certain disinformation, if there's misleading information um, in uh, the uh, information environment, you have to address that. You have to convince people that that is wrong. I know there are certain biases, cognitive biases that prevent um, such counter information from being the most effective remedy. People, there's, a, for example, a continued influence effect of misinformation. So in certain studies, it has been shown that people tend to believe false information even, even after it has been corrected. Um, so um, it's, it's difficult, but there's a certain minimum um, degree of trust that you have to have in citizens in a democracy. You know, if you think that all the citizens are just uh, all the citizens except yourself, usually, and the people you uh, like, all these others are irrational and they need to be told the right way, the truth, then this isn't compatible with democracy. In a democracy, you have to, in, as a basic uh, idea, convince others of also factual truth. Um, last point about the two conventions. Um, so how could international law be addressed on an international level? 
in, the, in this interstate level in a sense. Um, I think the two conventions are interesting for their design, which I can talk about in two sentences, but um, also because they have never been applied, really. I mean, they there are a couple of um, um, states that signed them, that ratified them, but as far as I found, there's not one instance of application of these two treaties. Why is that? Um, it may be that, um, for one, even if they worked, even if you would apply them, they could only apply to exceptional cases. It's not like social media regulation where you have like thousands, millions of statements that you need to regulate. On this, on a state level, um, this would necessarily be the exception, I think, also for um, policy reasons. Imagine if you um, have a State, distorted statement that you think injures your relations with other states and to you issue a right to reply. This could have a, a sort of Streisand effect. Possibly no one might have known about the statement, but if you have it um, distributed by other states, by the UN Secretary General, everybody will know about it. So that is a design problem in a sense. On the other hand, um, it's is interesting, the, um, the, the correction convention in particular, the right of reply correct uh, convention is interesting because it can react to false and distorted statements even coming from non-contracting states. So um, because it kind of creates a network of cooperating states which promise to each other to amplify the other's reply and statement. So it, it doesn't even um, need attribution, which uh, Mark Milanovic mentioned brightly can be a problem in uh, such um, um, constellations. So last sentence, I think it should be a, uh, it has to be necessarily a mix of measures. There isn't this one um, measure that can solve all the problems that is a silver bullet in this context. And legal problems can be, uh, can help, but they, yeah, won't they won't make this information go away. Oh, I would love to, to argue with you, but um, that's that's not the platform. Uh, yeah, perhaps uh, there is a question from uh, again from the second uh, panel panelist. Uh, a question about uh, imminent danger, and uh, Mr. Gulner, uh, please uh, take the floor. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, we don't want to have the second panel already in the first one, but since we have this uh, academic um, uh, uh, discussion at the moment, I just wanted to come back to this point on harms. Um, I think it was mainly for Mr. Milanovic, but I would also be interested for the others. Could we um, possibly, or could you uh, see a construction of a the disinformation and uh, let's say information manipulation at large could have an impact, a negative impact on, on a broader concept. We spoke a lot about public health, but could it also be civic or civil discourse? I don't know which term uh, you would prefer, for example, which would touch also exactly what we, what we are discussing here. Uh, that is one thing. So how do you feel about this term civic discourse or civil discourse? And the second point is you from a, from a scholarly perspective in particular, how would you uh, judge kind of the, uh, let's say uh, the burden of proof? Does it need to be an actual impact or can it be also a foreseeable negative impact here? Um, actually it would go to all three of you. Um, Thank you. Well, l let me maybe start. Um, so there's really two questions here. One is whether a, a more broadly defined harm, like harm to civic discourse, would be acceptable uh, in terms of state regulatory intervention uh, that actually restricts free speech. Uh, my sense is that it would not be. I cannot say this with 100% confidence. What I can say though, is that the more vaguely defined the harm, the more abstract the harm, the less likely that any law restricting speech would satisfy a necessity proportionality analysis. That said, there have been some such vaguely defined concepts that have passed muster, for example, before the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court, Court of Human Rights allowed France, for instance, to publish face coverings. That's before the pandemic really targeting 
Muslim women wearing uh, a veil uh, uh, on the basis that in France, there's some kind of idea that people should live together and that if you wear a face covering, you cannot live together. And the European Court of Human Rights somehow swallowed that. Now, after we have all worn masks for a very long time, we know that that's not exactly true, right? So it is in principle possible for such a vaguely uh, defined harm to pass muster, but if it's a criminal law, it becomes much more difficult to justify. The other issue that, that you mentioned is really gradations of causality. It's not really about burden of proof. It is the intensity of the causal connection between the false speech and the harm. The most intense sort of part of the spectrum is if you can prove that the speech did cause the harm. I told you that ingesting hydroxychloroquine cures COVID. You took hydroxychloroquine and then you had a heart attack. So that's the the most intense form of causal contribution. The less intense forms of causal contribution are likely to cause harm, you know, or can or may cause harm. So the lower down the causal scale you go, the more difficult it is to justify such a law, okay? Uh, there are two, for example, I mean, I can give you a very practical example. Russia adopted two criminal offenses, uh, 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 dealing with misinformation on, on COVID. One requires the false speech to have caused harm. That article of the criminal code is much more easier to justify than the one that does not require that type of causal connection. I mean, I cannot give you a more concrete answer. The, the basic point is simply the higher the causal requirements, the higher the culpability requirements, the easier it is to justify uh, a criminal law. But you do not need that, for example, in the sphere of online content moderation. If you're dealing with not criminal penalties, not civil penalties, you're just removing speech from a digital platform, it is much more easier to justify removing speech that is potentially harmful rather than having actually caused harm. So it really depends also on the penalty that is being imposed. Thank you. Uh, we will soon wrap up the first part of, the, of our discussion, but before that, uh... Uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Meyer a question. As a media scholar, uh, not as a not as a legal scholar, uh, my question is: Can you provide your judgment? Uh, well, wrong word. Your opinion, uh, also not good word. Okay, your your thoughts about whether the governments are doing better in fighting disinformation than platforms, or the platforms are doing better? As a media scholar, again, from the viewpoint of of media freedom and uh, uh, future of the media. Thank you. Interesting question. You're juxtaposing them. I think it often goes together. Um, I think um, the states that have a very hybrid approach um, are, are on the right track. Um, so where we are, and that's in part in response to, to, to kind of the previous question as well, where I want to remind that we don't have to just look at harm, not just the stick. How do we how do we deal with some of the problems that are out there? But how do you actually encourage the truth or uh, a, a civic discourse to to flourish? Um, and that's by having rules in place that allow for diversity of speech, that gives enough funding for uh, independent media, et cetera. So, so where we have those measures in place, along with then defining in a very precise way um, civic discourse and the harm that can be caused, for instance, in the context of elections and making sure that political parties are being honest, uh, but then also transparencies uh, from from. From, from, from a funding perspective, for instance, or uh, having something very defined around uh, terrorist content or child exploitation, et cetera. There we can really all see there is harm and there is uh, it, there is very much a potential. That's the sets of uh, uh, legislation where, or the, the areas, I would say, the policy areas where, where I think states should be intervening in terms of dealing with harm. But mostly, I, I hope that we're dealing, we're also looking at this from a perspective of enabling uh, uh, um, civic discourse to have a, a, a fair play. Um, and if people then still decide to have very polarizing views, well, then there's, there's, there's likely some trust uh, to, to go back to what the first speaker was saying, some trust that needs to be built up at a much more foundational level. Now, do I think platforms are doing better than states? 
I honestly do think they're doing their best, um, but they are private corporate actors that are very much embedded in a, in a U.S. context. And so all of, all of the angles are going to be uh, seen through there, um, uh, through that perspective. Um, I think we need to uh, pick up the, we, we need to kind of uh, uh, put a little bit more uh, pressure on them. Um, and I hope that my recommendations kind of uh, pushed, pushed in that direction. Removing Trump. Thank you very much. We already started arguing here <laughs> at, the, at the head table about what you're saying, uh, which is very good also. Uh, look, uh, we already have second uh, panel, second panel panelists knocking on the microphones, basically. So we need to make a break, but I kindly request uh, these three just speakers to stay uh, a lot. Uh, and, and, and be part of the discussion. When we come back in, in 10 minutes sharp, meaning 3.20. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your, uh, for your input. And uh, I look forward to more discussion. Right now we have 70 plus participants. I hope uh, the number will stay high in the second part as well. Thank you and see you in 10 minutes.
Um, ladies and gentlemen, we, we continue uh, with, uh, with our round table on international law and policy on this information um, in the context of freedom of the media. We have our second mini panel uh, that will be on international policy or intergovernmental policy. And we have four speakers. We'll start with uh, Ms. Gabrielle Gulmen, um, Senior Legal Officer of Article 19. And uh, allow me to say a few words about uh, her. Article 19, I think everybody present here knows about so this inter international NGO. Uh, but uh, we, uh, where she uh, where she works uh, as a legal legal advisor, but we uh, invited uh, Ms. Gulmen uh, mainly because of her role in um, drafting the uh, re report of the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on, on Freedom of Expression on this information. The uh, report is already available online uh, in, in several languages, in all UN languages actually. Uh, very very fast uh, uh, release of the of the report. Uh, it will be delivered in the end of June uh, in Geneva. Um, uh, but uh, I will not. Uh, I, I'll, I'm just I, I'm just saying it in order to alert your attention to the report itself uh, and uh, give the floor to Miss Gulman. Thank you very much for this introduction and thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So what I'm going to try to do uh, in the session is briefly introduce um, uh, the making of the UN Special Rapporteur's report on uh, disinformation. And uh, it was a pleasure for me to be able to assist her. I should just make clear that I was only advising uh, her. And um, so um, the report is her alone. Um, the um, I'd like to start first by explaining uh, how um, the, the, the topic uh, was chosen. I think uh, it was uh, clear um, that an enormous body of work had already been done uh, by David Kay, um, the previous UN Special Rapporteur, particularly in the area of digital rights, social media um, regulation more broadly, and hate speech in particular. However, it was also equally clear that um, disinformation um, was uh, a topic that as such hadn't really been addressed in depth um, at the UN level. It was also quite obviously a real challenge, uh, both in the context of various elections, but in particular the US elections, um, at the end of 2020 um, and uh, in the context of the pandemic. So um, I think it appeared uh, urgent to seek to give guidance at the international level on how uh, to approach the challenges thrown up by um, disinformation. Um, the second um, point about the making of the report is really um, the, the, the challenges um, that uh, we face in, uh, in approaching it. And really the first question was, what is a human rights approach to uh, this particular topic? And uh, a very practical one, which was how do we summarize and um, apprehend the vast wealth of knowledge in the multiple reports that have already been done and condense that into um, only 20 pages. So I think one of the first um, challenges uh, really was around the concepts. And um, I think the previous speakers have already done a tremendous job in presenting those. Um, but let's say um, that they were very much um, at the forefront um, of the challenges faced in, 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 in drafting the report, and in particular, trying to um, uh, draw on existing scholarship around disinformation versus misinformation, and trying to distinguish how 
these concepts can be used, uh, but also what it means to use them in different contexts, because it is not quite the same thing to describe a, a, um, a phenomena uh, as complex as disinformation and misinformation, and um, then crafting definitions for legal purposes. So, so this was uh, very much at the forefront of our minds. Um, the um, another uh, challenge um, uh, in in drafting the report was trying to explain the complexity uh, of the phenomenon, uh, the complexity in terms of the uh, actors and vectors, and and really trying to really. Um, bring to the fore, like, and, and explain how multidimensional this is, and that, um, and I think that goes to uh, the subsequent recommendations in the report that really try and um, reflect on. There's no one single silver bullet uh, to this dif difficult question. And so really it's uh, an effort that requires action on the part of multiple actors in order to, to address these challenges. Um, a, a third challenge, I think, um, it was also pretty central um, to, to, to the drafting was really to try and um, change the um, how Freedom of expression is often viewed as part of the problem uh, when looking at disinformation, misinformation. And really, um, this report, I think, seeks to assert that freedom of expression, on the contrary, is central to the solution. And the solution is really around creating an environment where um, reliable, authoritative information can flourish. Um, and so there are a lot of recommendations of the report to that effect in relation to the protection of journalists, in relation to um, um, support to uh, independent public service media, um, and to the, the publication by states themselves of reliable information um, on a range of issues of public interest. So um, I think um, uh, the, the, the recommendations of the report um, um, are available online. I'm very happy to go through them in more detail um, if thought useful. Um, I think I'll add that um, the report itself wanted was looking very much at the online aspects of it, but also very much wanted to recognize that just looking at these issues just from an online perspective is clearly insufficient. So I think it's a, it's a very important element here to bear in mind. And here I will recall all the things that have been said by um, the previous panel. Um, finally, I think um, one of the um, perhaps most groundbreaking um, aspects of the report is that it really, um, uh, it really uh, makes a clear demand on states to, to, for them to provide uh, accurate information themselves on a range of topics. And so I think this is something that was perhaps not as clearly stated under international human rights law, uh, but that it was felt important to, to reiterate because as been said by the previous speakers, uh, in practice, it is often the most damaging, the one that comes, that may come from uh, public institutions or, um, or other um, politicians or people in position of authority. Uh, finally, the special reporter has made a strong call for a, a really multi-stakeholder response uh, to these challenges. And uh, for the UN Human Rights Council in particular to drive initiatives in, in, in this sense. So really to continue the conversation uh, with the various actors involved, um, governments, companies, the media, civil society, to reflect on the most appropriate solutions to, to the challenges um, of um, disinformation and misinformation. The report does not explicitly address um, disinformation um, 
coming from one state and targeting the population of another state, uh, as this is an issue that would have required much more reflection and a continuation. But that goes, I think, to the spirit of this report, which doesn't aim at being necessarily exhaustive on these issues, but really wants to initiate a dialogue uh, with various stakeholders on them. So I think I'll end here and um, I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I uh, urge uh, all interested participants to take a look at the report again. I mean, I just sent the link. It, it is available in, in several uh, OSC languages, Spanish, uh, uh, English, and uh, Russian. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful reading, actually. But um, uh, let me pass uh, the microphone to Urska Umek, uh, our longtime colleague and, uh, and uh, who represents uh, an organization with which OEC, representative of Freedom of the Media, uh, works a lot together. Uh, Urska uh, heads the media unit uh, in the Secretariat of the Council of Europe. Uh, in the Information Society Department, and uh, we'll talk about uh, the Council of Europe response to this information with a PowerPoint presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thanks also for inviting the Council of Europe to this uh, extremely interesting meeting um, today. Um, and to, to, to allow us to present our own approaches and possible solutions to the problem of disinformation. Um, so perhaps just an introductory sentence about the Council of Europe. We are a human rights organization and um, we are also primarily a standard setting organization. So the focus of my presentation will, of course, be on how disinformation affects human rights, um, but also democracy at large, and um, perhaps what solutions may be taken that are at the same time um, effective and um, in line with established human rights standards. Um, so I will echo probably a lot of what had already been said before me, but please bear with me. Uh, first observation to make, um, and I think um, I, I need to recall what Gabrielle was saying, um, is that because disinformation is a very complex phenomenon, um, has many varieties, also, of course, solutions are manifold, um, some of them legal, some of them non-legal. But um, let's go to, first of all, um, why disinformation is a problem from human rights perspective. And I think this, um, in, in some way, this slide also echoes um, what Professor Milanovic was saying about specific harms um, that can be produced by disinformation. Um, I see at least three harms, which I will base on, on for example, these five um, rights, um, also convention rights, although the right to health is not specific, um, um, specifically enshrined in the European Convention on Human Rights, um, but it is to be found there as uh, part of the right to life and also um, part of the right to private life. Um, so three ways in which disinformation impacts human rights um, directly by impacting on individuals' opinion making and also decision making. Um, and um, to, to even go further, impacting on public opinion. So, for example, falsehoods about political candidates, um, also in form of concerted campaigns, can lead to um, um, swaying electoral outcomes. It, it has been known to happen, um, and that, of course, affects the right to free and uh, fair elections. Um, then the other um, the other effect of disinformation is one that begins in the sort of online sphere, but has actual consequences um, in offline sphere. For example, um, it can disinformation can generate confusion, mistrust, which is then somehow manifested in real time hostility and discrimination, usually by majority groups towards minority groups. Um, and to just give a recent example in the COVID, uh, context of COVID-19, we've seen a rise in hostility online and offline um, towards the Chinese and um, the entire Asian community um, on account of the origin of the virus. Um, and then, third way, which was already mentioned, um, in which disinformation affects human rights, 
it can prompt and it does prompt occasionally excessive knee-jerk responses, which in itself is a problem from human rights perspective. So what have, has happened also, for example, recently in the context of COVID um, was that um, there were um, responses um, through legislation, criminalization of information deemed false or uh, likely to create panic, which is rather vague. Um, and and these kind of um, responses obviously can lead to censorship. It can, they can lead to suppression of dissent um, and, um, and they impact on the right to freedom of expression. Now, um, I was not going to really talk about what facilitates disinformation because we, I think, have somewhat covered that. Um, but um, I was prompted by actually a remark of Ms. Ribeiro, one of the introductory remark about trust in media as an antidote to disinformation. And I would just like to echo this perhaps here, um, because indeed what facilitates disinformation is the entire nature of today's um, media and communication environment, uh, such as it is, it really does allow to um, spread disinformation much faster at a much greater scale um, than fact-checked information. But I, I would just mention here that um, research shows that there is less concern about disinformation in those countries where news and media enjoy considerable trust. Um, so where they're able to perform their functions of informing people, also functions of exercising democratic control over those in power. Um, obviously, Precondition for that, that people have trust in their news sources, is that the media needs to be strong and empowered, meaning also financially sustainable. But if, if these preconditions are met, then people do not perceive false information as a major problem because they can resort to more reliable sources. Um, and also, according to research done by European Broadcasting Union, the higher the level of trust in countries broadcasting media, um, the um, higher is also or tends to be the level of media freedom in a particular country. So actually reinforcing media freedom does act quite directly or there is at least a direct correlation with um, um, disabling the power of disinformation. Um, now, we have talked about what sort of action is taken by states and platforms, so I don't want to go too much into that. But I would reiterate one of the points that has been made before, um, and that is that the approach as to how to tackle disinformation um, depend or quite um, convincingly on whether um, something, some type of disinformation is considered illegal speech or not. Um, because for illegal speech, there is more clarity as to responsibilities. Um, also on the part of states, obviously, it is much easier to um, provide some sort of legislation for something that can be manifestly or at least somewhat clearly illegal. But when we're talking only about harmful legis uh, harmful information, of course, um, there we, we, we sort of enter the grain zone of potentially uh, very subjective um, um, definitions. Um, the question is, of course, whether false information um, even if it has um, as its um, objective um, to cause harm, um, whether it can be deemed as illegal. Now, obviously, no, not always. Um, in fact, in many cases, it will not be, um, it will not sort of reach the threshold um, to, be, to be able to be called illegal. Um, but sometimes, I think that Professor Milanovic said that before me, um, sometimes false speech um, does attain the level of harm um, that it doesn't need to be and merits to be sanctioned. For everything else, um, the gray zone, um, I think that um, um, Dr. Meyer has explained that platforms, in fact, do a lot by their own private initiatives 
initiatives, they flag content, they prioritize authoritative um, um, sources, um, they um, demote content, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot to be to be done um, by, by themselves also. But the issue is, of course, that because um, what is illegal um, also um, has um, is very much dependent on uh, specific contexts. Um, any kind of restrictions of freedom of expression are always rather nuanced and depending on many criteria, um, as already in many, many cases um, reiterated by the European Court of Human Rights. And nuanced responses are not really fit for the nature and scale of disinformation um, that happens online. And they're not also fit for the scale of automate, automated or even human content moderation. So um, content moderation is unavoidable, but um, I would reiterate that there needs to be a possibility of review. Now, independent oversight boards or social media councils, they are definitely a big step forward, but I think that still judicial review um, is just as or even more important. So sort of to reserve the final judgment on whether something is um, harmful enough to merit the uh, label of illegality, um, that should be left to the courts. And that, by extension, also requires um, an effective way of accessing courts. Um, and then perhaps just to um, give you a little bit of a, an insight into the fine lines between what is protected and what can be sanctioned, under Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, now, first of all, opinions already are allowed with very few restrictions. So it's, it's always very difficult to, um, to, to, to in any way legislate opinions or sanction opinions. Um, but even when these opinions rely on underlying facts, uh, the situation um, is not that clear and it's quite nuanced. And maybe just to give um, one example, um, um, I have here put on the slide the case of Hertel versus Switzerland, um, which is rather interesting one because the applicant here argued based on studies that he had made um, that food prepared in microwave ovens um, had harmful effects on human health, that basically microwave ovens were um, carcinogenic. Um, and um, this is sort of evocative of, of the problems that we have with a lot of misinformation in the context of COVID. That's why I'm mentioning this case. Um, the national courts first issued an injunction, and interestingly, under the Unfair Competition Act, this injunction was issued, and they prohibited the applicant um, to make any kind of public statements about um, the danger of microwaved food. Um, but this was found to be in violation of Article 10 of the Convention because it was such a sweeping um, prohibition of speech. And then after reopening the case at the national level, um, the Swiss courts did no longer prevent the applicant from generally disseminating his views on the danger of microwave ovens. But what they did was to require him um, to reference, um, to make references to current differences of opinion when he was making these statements. Um, uh, essentially, um, not allowing him to say that his opinions were scientifically proven. Um, so this was then in the final instance confirmed by the um, Strasbourg court as proportionate interference with the applicant's right. Um, and here we also see a little bit because I, I think that there was a question before about foreseeable versus real effects um, um, of, of, of a harm that here we were talking mostly or the court was addressing mostly foreseeable uh, negative um, effects. Um, now, 
just quickly um, about what the Council of Europe is doing um, in addition to uh, its rich uh, case law of the court. Um, in a more practical way, we are trying and we have done so um, first by um, a report on information disorder where we've sort of provided a framework for policymaking um, to, to give recommendations to different, um, um, to, to, to different entities that have the power to act against disinformation. Um, so we have, um, as of 2017, um, recommendations for tech companies, governments, media, civil society, um, and international uh, institutions, ourself, ourselves included. And we have sort of acted upon those. I can obviously later on explain much more in detail um, if, if that would be of interest. But um, what we're trying to do is to assist through standards, because we are a standard setting organization, and also support measures. Um, and I have put here on the slide a few of them. So um, one way of, um, of, of countering disinformation, as mentioned, is empowering quality journalism or um, ethical journalism. Um, and we have a recommendation pending that is hopefully going to be adopted very soon on this particular issue. We have um, also put a lot of emphasis on access to official information, especially in the context of COVID, we have really sort of been forced on that and um, perhaps even as a result of that finally um, the convention on access to official documents was ratified by 10 countries last year and is now in force. Um, we also um, uh, try to empower the soft skills. So, for example, media information literacy skills are very important um, in, in, in this um, context and we try to promote um, integrating these uh, skills in uh, regulatory frameworks um, so as to give them more um, of um, a focus and um, obviously more um, of attention. Um, and then in terms of standards in the area of um, digital technologies, um, we have been trying to ensure compliance of online platforms um, with human rights standards. Um, and we have a recommendation um, to that effect from 2018, and then another one that goes more into, um, into algorithmic systems and their various capabilities. Um, so there is a recommendation from 2020 on that. And essentially, um, because I cannot obviously go into details about all of these uh, policy documents, one thing that I would say is that um, in addition to um, addressing the states directly through these recommendations, what we also try to do is to address um, other important stakeholders, including online platforms directly and sort of um, um, assign certain responsibility, human rights related responsibilities to them. So thank you very much. And I'm obviously um, um, going to be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I ask everybody to, to keep to the time limit uh, and uh, uh, Ushka, you understand why I raise it at this moment. Um, I also request everybody to switch into translation mode because we will continue in Russian in a minute. Uh, I pass the floor to Alexander Alexandrovich Smirnov, who is Executive Secretary of the Scientific Advisory Council of the Anti-Terrorist Center of the uh, Commonwealth of Independent States. Uh, he's, um, he has a doctorate in legal sciences and um, um, he wrote a very interesting uh, book, I would say. It's a book, yes. Uh, uh, unfortunately, only in Russian uh, and published um, a couple of months ago, which is titled Organization of Counter Propaganda in the Field of Combating Terrorism and Extremism, which also uh, speaks well, not, not a lot, but to some degree about issues of disinformation and uh, which at least I read with, with uh, big interest. Alexander Alexandrovich, вам слово, пожалуйста. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Я надеюсь, меня нормально слышно. Приветствую вас из Москвы. Меня зовут Смирнов Александр. Я представляю антитеррористический центр государств-участников СНГ. 
Наш центр является специализированным органом Содружества независимых государств, который предназначен для обеспечения координации взаимодействия компетентных органов в сфере борьбы с терроризмом и иными проявлениями экстремизма. Хотелось бы вначале поблагодарить офис представителя по вопросам свободы медиа ОБСЕ и персонально Андрея Рихтера за приглашение принять участие в таком интересном мероприятии. Сегодня мы обсуждаем тему дезинформации фейковых новостей. Хотелось бы отметить, что данная проблема не является новой и как бы, корни ее уходят далеко в вглубь истории. Например, можно вспомнить... Александра, великого полководца Александра Македонского, который использовал тактику, предполагавшую распространение ложных сведений о а, численном преимуществе своего войска для устрашения противников. Однако в современных условиях действительно проблема дезинформации резко обострилась, и тому есть комплекс факторов, комплекс условий. Я не буду их все перечислять, об этом говорили предыдущие спикеры, но большинство из них связано как раз с развитием новых информационных технологий. В частности, вот эксперты часто в данном контексте говорят о феномене, так называемом, не феномене, а понятии постправды, когда для большее, большее влияние на формирование общественного мнения оказывает те сообщения, которые апеллируют к личным убеждениям или каким-то эмоциональным вещам, нежели к, ну, к критерию истинности. А в данном контексте, на мой взгляд, нужно рассматривать и новые аспекты, которые порождаются технологиями искусственного интеллекта. В частности, так называемая проблема глубоких фейков, глубоких фейков, deepfakes. Поэтому обращение мирового сообщества пристального внимания на данную тему, на наш взгляд, вполне обосновано. Вместе с тем, как и говорили предыдущие спикеры, дезинформация – это не какой-то единый целостный самостоятельный феномен. Это скорее широкая палитра видов коммуникации, в основе которых лежит распространение ложных недостоверных сведений. Собственно, эта палитра была достаточно хорошо обрисована в докладах предыдущих спикеров. Соответственно, дезинформация может проявляться в совершенно разных контекстах. В контексте именно информационной войны между странами, в контексте пропаганды деструктивного толка, в контексте межличностного общения, да, межличностной коммуникации. И а, вот одна из мыслей, которую я хотел бы донести, состоит в том, что... А, Подходы к регулированию вот этих совершенно разных форм дезинформации, они тоже должны быть релевантными, да, адекватными, они должны быть максимально гибкими. И, конечно же, вот объективную научную оценку данной проблематики мешает вот такая чрезвычайная политизированность данной темы. Когда мы рассматриваем угрозу, дезинформацию, исходящую от экстремистских и террористических организаций, мы рассматриваем несколько аспектов. Первым, наиболее таким очевидным аспектом является так называемые заведомо ложные сообщения об актах терроризма. Данное, преступление признается, данное деяние признается преступлением в странах Содружества независимых государств. Как правило, оно представляет собой сообщение по телефону о заложенном взрывном устройстве, которое злоумышленники угрожают привести в действие. Такие действия совершают разные люди, как психически нездоровые люди, подростки, которые таким образом пытаются пошутить. Но бывает, что и такие сигналы исходят от самих террористов, которые таким образом как бы прощупывают реакцию государства, либо стараются отвести внимание силовых структур от истинных целей атак. Но а, более, опасно тут, более опасным является именно факты массового или верного распространения таких сообщений о ложных минированиях. В частности, с такой волной в последние годы столкнулась Российская Федерация. Только за несколько месяцев 2019 года поступили сообщения о более чем 16 тысячах объектов, якобы заминированных. 
террористами. Эти сообщения направлялись через различные сервисы электронной почты, мессенджеры и так далее, причем используя специальные инструменты обеспечения анонимности. Это говорит о том, что это некая профессиональная деятельность, да, не просто там шалость подростков. Кроме того, в контексте терроризма угроза дезинформации проявляется и в пропагандистской деятельности террористических организаций. В частности, в рамках своей пропаганды они распространяют вот как раз такие ложные нарративы, которые основаны на извращенной интерпретации различных там, религиозных текстов, каких-то научных концепций и так далее. Вот. И здесь очень опасную, опасность состоит в том, что, как правило, эти ложные нарративы, они носят характер мифов, да, мифологии. И их очень трудно опровергнуть с помощью каких-то рациональных аргументов. Как раз в дискуссиях звучал вопрос, возможно ли правда. Да? Вот здесь вот очень проблематично является именно опровержение таких сообщений. Ну и кроме того, прием обмана и манипуляции сознания используются экстремистскими в рамках вербовки. Здесь такая, распространение такой дезинформации осуществляется как в рамках межличностного общения, так и в рамках групповой коммуникации в многочисленных виртуальных сообществах. Хотелось бы отметить, что нашим центром изучается положительный опыт государства участников СНГ в области противодействия информационной активности, деструктивной информационной активности террористических экстремистских организаций, включая дезинформацию. А правовую основу этой работы составляет многочисленный блок международных договоров и национального законодательства, который принят в странах Содружества. Ну, я не буду все документы перечислять, хотелось бы отметить, что вот практические мероприятия со сотрудничества государств вот по борьбе с этими угрозами заложены в межгосударственную программу. А в этой области вот в данный момент действует такая программа на период 20-22 годов. А если мы анализируем саму вот непосредственную деятельность компетентных органов, то здесь можно выделить пять основных направлений противодействия. Первое направление, о котором много говорили предыдущие спикеры, это криминализация различных форм дезинформации и привлечение к юридической ответственности виновных лиц. Я выше уже говорил о том, что вот как раз заведомо ложное сообщение об актах терроризма признается преступлением. А в 2019 году в Российской Федерации в законе была установлена административная, не уголовная, а именно административная ответственность за распространение фейковой информации. Я не буду сейчас приводить юридическое определение фейков, которое там было закреплено, но вот признак заведомости, на который обращали внимание предыдущие спикеры, там получил закрепление. Да? То есть это именно распространение заведомо ложной информации. В качестве наказания за такое деяние предусмотрен штраф для физических и юридических лиц, и размер этого штрафа он как раз варьируется в зависимости от тяжести последствий. Следующим направлением противодействия является закрепление правовых запретов и ограничений на распространение ложной информации – в масс-медиа и сети интернет. Собственно, принцип свободы массовой информации закреплен в конституциях и законодательстве стран Содружества, но при этом установлены некие пределы реализации этого права да, и те ограничения, которые допускаются согласно международным стандартам. В частности, вот в российском законе о средствах массовой информации в число форм злоупотребления свободы СМИ отнесено распространение материалов, содержащих публичные призывы к осуществлению террористической деятельности, либо публичное оправдание терроризма, другие экстремистские материалы и иной запрещенной законами информации. Вот как раз фейковая информация после принятия поправок 2019 года как раз в эту категорию попадает. Соблюдение, соответственно, введенных ограничений контролируется специальным органом, который называется Роскомнадзор. 
Третье направление – это ограничение доступа к экстремистскому контенту и ложным сообщениям в сети интернет. Нужно отметить, что в странах Содружества уже достаточно длительный период действуют специальные правовые алгоритмы ограничения доступа к незаконному контенту в интернете. И, соответственно, предпринимаются попытки введения как бы, под, в поле действия данных алгоритмов как раз фейковых сообщений. Это уже реализовано в Российской Федерации, и такая инициатива в настоящий момент обсуждается в Республике Беларусь. Само решение о блокировке оно может выноситься как судебными органами, так и административными органами. Но в последнем случае гарантируется возможность судебного обжалования таких решений. Четвертое направление – это разъяснительная и контрпропагандистская работа. Собственно, у правоохранительных структур стран Содружества сформировалось четкое представление о том, что исключительно запретами – побороть угрозу распространения дезинформации невозможно. В этой связи проводится большой объем работы по разъяснению, да, по разъяснению, допустим, обще, вообще общественной опасности терроризма и экстремизма, возможных формах их проявления в цифровой среде, разоблачению как раз лживых вот, нарративов экстремистской пропаганды и предложению каких-то альтернативных позитивных идей. Вот для борьбы с фейками именно данное направление является очень важным, потому что они распространяются, особенно в новых медиа, да, в соцсетях и мессенджерах, ну, очень быстро, подобно лесному пожару. Поэтому нужно, нужна очень быстрая и четкая реакция. И прежде всего эта реакция должна быть со стороны пресс-служб правоохранительных и иных государственных органов. И последнее направление, о котором здесь много говорилось, это направление повышения медиаграмотности и культуры кибербезопасности. Понятное дело, что никакая, никакие самые эффективные фильтры, никакая самая совершенная работа правоохранительных структур не обеспечит ну, как бы создание какой-то стерильной информационной среды и там, устранение самой угрозы. Да? Поэтому важное значение приобретает формирование критического мышления и иных компетенций медиаграмотности вот самого конечного звена информационной цепочки, да, это потребителя. Это вообще, кстати, ценность данного инструмента, она выходит только за рамки там, угрозы дезинформации, а вообще это один из лучших инструментов обеспечения информационной безопасности в медийной среде. А помимо широкого комплекса обучающих мероприятий, которые реализуются в странах Содружества, предпринимаются попытки введения соответствующих тематических модулей в программу школьного образования. Очень позитивная инициатива исходит и как раз от предприятий технологические отрасли, в частности, хорошие мероприятия по формированию культуры кибербезопасности реализуются, например, такими крупными компаниями, как Яндекс и лаборатория Касперского. Завершая свое выступление, хотелось бы отметить следующее. Цифровая среда по мере своего развития будет дальше продуцировать новые информационные риски. Для ответа на них требуется выработка согласованных подходов и совместных усилий, которые бы позволили эффективно противодействовать данным угрозам. Любые локальные меры в условиях глобального информационного пространства будут заведомо недостаточны. И в этой связи нам представляется важным реализация вот предложенных Российской Федерацией и поддержанных многими странами мира инициатив по принятию универсальных международных договоров в сфере международной информационной безопасности, а также в сфере борьбы с преступностью и терроризмом в информационной среде. Большое спасибо за внимание. Спасибо, Александр Александрович. И я очень рад, что не только мы находимся в офисе сейчас, а и вы в Москве, в отличие от многих других, которые дома. Спасибо за наши встречи. Meanwhile, I would like to pass the floor to um, our next and uh, uh, I see last speaker today. 
uh, Mr. Lutz Gülner, who is the head of division for strategic communication and information analysis in the European External Action Service. Uh, Mr. Lutz, uh, Mr. Gülner, I'm sorry, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and the last speaker always has the um, difficult role of either to repeat a lot of points or to reinforce. So I will really I'll just make, up. or kind of to sum them up or to challenge them. So I will try to do maybe the more interesting part rather to, to repeat what we heard. But I think it's pretty clear that uh, disinformation, and I will introduce also a different term in a moment, is not only a societal issue, uh, but it can have a bigger dimension, can even be a security issue, it can be a foreign policy issue as well. And I think um, that, that is also a dimension we need to keep in mind, uh, in any case, one of the instruments uh, that is used um, uh, more and more uh, in, in also in international relations. If I Kind of refer, for example, to a very interesting study of the Oxford Internet Institute um, that many of you know, um, and where uh, it came to the conclusion that disinformation or online manipulations are actually used by more and more actors internationally, state actors mainly, uh, but also not to uh, totally um, ad, um, omit, of course, also non-state actors. So we have here a sort of industrial scale problem, which becomes uh, which becomes bigger and bigger, and which uh, which really needs to to be tackled, as we heard from from many. But let me maybe uh, make a few points for the European Union perspective here as well, and just refer to some of the instruments that we put in place already. Um, and then uh, already close and that we have enough time for, for discussion. So number one is really um, that we uh, suggest to avoid a definition that is too closely fixed uh, to the content because that can be a very dangerous, uh, a very dangerous uh, slope here. Uh, the more we focus on, on content, as we heard by many of the speakers, in particular our academic uh, colleagues in the first uh, panel is, the more we get into the question of truth and non-truth. But even if we use a term like uh, something which is often used kind of verifiably uh, uh, false or verifiable um, content, even that might be might be quite tricky and that's why our proposal and our current work also focuses very much on moving away from a content-based perspective of disinformation more to an actor-based um, uh, and behavior of these actors-based uh, uh, definition and i think that is quite important because then we don't need to judge what is right and what is wrong, what we like, what we don't like with normative concepts, but we can define much better which action um, is actually uh, to be, let's say, taken into consideration when we develop uh, uh, respective instruments, when we uh, develop respective regulation as well. So the, the fact is, is therefore, it's not so much the disinformation or a term that I don't like at all, the fake news, but it's really about the manipulation of the information space. And I think this is a key term that we should, uh, should really focus on. Manipulation of the information space that can have a content element, but it very often has also uh, manipulation of uh, reach, for example, manipulation of identities, uh, because this is, of course, also what is, what is happening. So in this, in this reflection, um, also, what is extremely important, some of you have mentioned this already, is to clearly distinguish illegal forms of disinformation, which are already regulated by law. We can discuss these laws and they all need to be, of course, anchored in international law. But the real issue is, what do we do with a non-illegal uh, content, which is harmful, which uh, is a problem for our societies, uh, for um, many other things, and we just had this deba debate about what is really the threshold, where do we need to set the harm. Uh, but I just wanted to make this point again, uh, that we don't kind of mix up clearly illegal and kind of this gray zone of non-illegal um, uh, uh, content. Second thing is, um, then coming back to what I just said, if we focus more on the, on the manipulation, on the manipulative side of things, we of course need to define 
what type of manipulation is, um, let's say, to be outlawed, which one is to be looked at, um, how can we capture them. And I think all these elements um, come back uh, in our discussions over and over again because of a very simple fact is that we see disinformation activities quickly evolving as well. They are evolving in terms of the technical means uh, that are uh, available and they are evolving because there are more and more or other actors also that are using this, state actors, non-state actors, uh, cross-border um, activities or just domestic uh, activities. And I think this evolution really thinks us also to, um, or, or makes us think to, or forces us maybe to think um, a little bit further than just looking at the situation of today but also the situation, let's say, of tomorrow. In which direction will, will this go? Because one risk uh, that we're all facing is if we want to regulate uh, this situation, and if we focus on, a, on, on the, the status quo, let's say, of today, then we might not capture kind of what is coming in the future, and we need to adjust and adjust and adjust. So key element is this idea of manipulation and intention. And I think here, um, key is is also we did not speak about this uh, very much in in this panel here um, is really to define a little bit clearer what are these manipulative tactics techniques and procedures uh, that need to be looked at a small example uh, two or three years ago there was a large debate about social bots a lot of scholars that uh, also suggested uh, should be outlawed, uh, freedom of speech for real people and not for social bots. You remember this slogan? Um, made a lot of sense three, four years ago. Um, nowadays, if we look at the, at the current situation, uh, bots are not so much the problem because they are quite easily detectable. Um, so the problem is shifting into, into different areas. And I think this is maybe one of the additional thoughts that I wanted to bring in here. In terms of uh, answers, in terms of responses to disinformation, just very briefly, I think there is no silver bullet. There is not the one instrument, either in international law nor in domestic law, that will help us to address the issue. Um, I think it's a typical wicked problem, as we call it. So a problem that cannot be solved, where we cannot find a solution, but where we can mitigate as much as we uh, possibly can. Um, and here is uh, the answer is we need many responses, many different instruments, most likely at the same time. Uh, the previous speaker uh, spoke about five different different instruments. I would even mention many more um, because we have, um, let's say, three or four different areas that we need to look at. We need to understand, of course, what is going on here also. Uh, we need to invest more in this situational awareness. I think there are a number of activities already that we need to do. Second point is uh, what a lot of you have mentioned is on the resilience of societies in terms of um, awareness, in terms of cybersecurity, in terms of digital literacy, but then something that many of you have mentioned also, in terms of media, the media ecosystem, uh, to strengthen it, uh, trustworthiness in indicators, and many, many more. I, I don't want to read out the whole list because I think it would be too long. Uh, then thirdly would be the question of disruption or regulation. Um, I think one of the issues that, uh, again, we have discussed, and the fourth one is, of course, when we come to cross-border, uh, the cross-border dimension of this information uh, is not only what are the international conventions that we need to anchor any action in, but also what are potential instruments, you know, what can we use actually in this very, uh, let's say, uh, a deteriorized um, uh, uh, area, you know, where we don't have an easy law that is applicable here and there. So where we need to go into much more diplomatic and maybe other, other tools as well. Last element from my side, um, the European Union has started to develop uh, a very ambitious and also, also multifaceted approach to disinformation. And I would just like to refer to two instruments that we uh, that we developed. The first one is the Action Plan Against Disinformation, which is already two or three years ago, which basically says we need to do four things. The first one is we need to understand the issue. 
um, it sounds always so banal, but it is so important. The second one is we need to connect the, the, the different actors much better, civil society actors, governmental actors. Third one is uh, the issue of how do we approach um, especially the social media platforms. And the fourth one is, of course, everything around resilience, media, media literacy. And uh, only a few months ago, uh, we have adopted um, uh, a new uh, uh, policy instrument that, again, some of you might know, which is called the European Democracy Action Plan, which places the issue of disinformation firmly as a key concept of democracy. Also something that we want or that there are um, let's say public goods, that there are values that we want to protect. And the first one is, is political, the political processes. The second one is the media, uh, the integrity and the also, uh, let's say, the, the vibrant media space. And the third one is then to, to address hands on the disinformation um, elements. And one needs to think all these things at the same time. I will uh, post the link to this European Democracy Action Plan in a moment so that you can also have a look at this. I would like to say a last word on our own kind of uh, regulatory um, uh, approaches uh, to social media platforms. There is actually an existing tool which is called uh, the Code of Practice, which is um, still a non-binding, a voluntary, but nevertheless um, an instrument with quite stringent um, reporting requirements for which we will update kind of the rules in a few weeks time. So uh, you will see in a few weeks time quite a strengthened code of practice. Um, those of you who don't know the code of practice, it uh, imposes a number of very important reporting requirements on the platforms, but also transparency and ac accountability uh, requirements or obligations um, for, the, for the platforms to tackle the issue. And the last element, uh, that we are uh, developing and you may have seen the proposal is actually legislation. It's a legislative act. It's called the Digital Services Act, which tackles, let's say, the broader digital services environment, but specifically also the uh, disinformation or the problem of manipulation of the services of, uh, of social media platforms. And rather than regulating the content, rather than saying this is allowed and this is not allowed, it actually does something from my perspective, but uh, you will not be surprised to hear that I like it. Um, it does something quite intelligent. It does not try to regulate the content as such, but it says there is a risk for our democratic values. There is a risk for our um, for public goods. And some of them you have seen in my question already. And because there is a risk, there is an obligation for the platforms to put in place proper systems uh, to assess this risk and to mitigate uh, that risk. So um, I think this is maybe one uh, element that could be um, a good basis also for future development uh, in international uh, cooperation in this field. So rather than putting certain things in boxes is, is more defining, okay, what is it that we want to protect? And what is the public good also that we want to protect? And then to define how it is best protected and which, uh, let's say, obligations and requirements really accrue from this, uh, from this obligation and to put this in a sort of, uh, in a sort of a regulatory or co-regulatory framework. Um, I think I'll stop here, otherwise I'm too long and we don't have that much time left anymore for um, uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gulner. Uh, indeed, there is no silver bullet, you're, you're right. Uh, but uh, I would like to raise a question to all participants in the second panel. And uh, Ushka, will you please uh, not only unmute yourself, but also, yeah, thank you. So. As persons who have contributed and continue to contribute, some of you, to the um, policy making of intergovernmental organizations in Europe and the uh, and, uh, UN as well, uh, what will be your main advice, main advice, just one possible, to the OSC as a security organization, regional security organization, which has a special focus on human dimension and human rights as a uh, comprehensive security element. If you can think about such advice now, or if not later, you would really appreciate. But maybe you have any 
prompt response to this uh, not easy question. Thank you. Perhaps I would begin, uh, so as not to prolong the silence, um, but quickly, I think that in your question already there is an answer, because um, if you are trying to approach um, the phenomenon of disinformation um, from a comprehensive perspective, I think that comprehensive approach is needed, and I would echo pretty much everybody who has spoken about it and say that um, there is no silver bullet, but that there are specific solutions for specific areas and that I think that you're already doing that to some extent, at least, um, and that all of these um, 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 areas need to be addressed, ranging from media regulation and empowerment of journalism to um, um, indeed uh, assessing the risks um, on the part of the platforms and providing um, um, obligations for them also to, um, to, to, to assess these risks um, and obviously to put in place mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera media literacy was mentioned. So I think that um, indeed um, making this um, an issue high on the agenda of the organization and then working consistently on different topics is sort of um, the best solution that I can think of um, at this point. Thank you. Anyone wants, wants to add? Yeah, I, I would uh, I would echo that, of course. Um, I mean, I just uh, explained a little bit our approach, and we, of course, as European Union, have a, have a fairly similar, uh, let's say, challenge also to bring all these different aspects together and not to look at it from a too, let's say, narrow base of all this, because this is more about let's say fake news. This is more about junk news. This is about how a society lives together and how it can uphold its values because this is in the end what is what is under threat. And for, I mean, my recommendation to the OSCE would be to link this, um, not, um, let's all, not to put it into a corner of a fringe issue, um, but to make it much more central because uh, the issue is linked to the digital development, it is linked to human rights, it is linked to uh, security issues, it is linked to cooperation issues. I can make this list even longer. Um, it is a cross-cutting issue. That's why there is no easy answer to that, but the more we address it, the more we think about it and the more we find maybe partial solutions and build the puzzle also of the things that we need to put in place, ideally in cooperation and ideally in, um, let's say, in a, in a manner that also uh, adequately addresses the issue, the better it is. At least that would be my recommendation. And um, I'd like to certainly echo uh, what the previous speakers uh, have said on this. Um, and it's very much in line with, I think, the report of the UN Special Rapporteur, which calls for these multi-stakeholder, multi-dimensional approaches, because it's impossible otherwise to really address the phenomenon. But I think I should also reiterate um, uh, what's uh, said very clearly in, in uh, that report um, is also for the high representative for the media, for media freedom, to continue uh, the work around uh, the protection of journalists, because what was very clear during um, the, the drafting of the report, the special report actually received 119 contributions. Many of those relate to criminal laws being used to crack down on journalists and what they say and reporting. So I think, it, it, I just want to reiterate the message that was said earlier um, um, uh, by uh, the previous speakers in the first session, in particular Dr. M Marko Milanovic, that uh, full city by itself is not a legitimate aim for restricting free expression and that criminal law is really the very last resort. Um, there would have to be a very high threshold to be met in terms of the harms, like a very high threshold in relation to uh, the definition of harms. So, um, and in practice, uh, what, what, what was very clear from the contributions that were received is that uh, criminal laws are abused. So I think it's very important to, to continue that work with a view to protecting journalists and enable them to create that uh, plural information ecosystem. 
So I think it's uh, it's just a point I just really wanted to to stress once again. Um, and uh, media literacy is also, of course, a very important part of this uh, in, in educating uh, people to so that they can better assess the information that is put in front of them. And as was said again earlier. Uh, in the first session to really equip them to make their own judgment um, uh, about the information they receive rather than leaving it up to um, states and governments to decide uh, uh, for them. Um, and just lastly, because we've also talked a lot about um, social media platforms, it's uh, quite obvious that they're a very important part uh, also of the response. And here I would just wanted to draw uh, attention to um, the special reporters report that really um, enjoins the companies to take a look again at their business model, uh, which can contribute uh, in some instances to, um, to the dissemination of information that you know you may not necessarily, which is not necessarily uh, the most authoritative. So I think it's a, it's an important aspect of that report. And um, when it comes to uh, regulation, really to focus on process and transparency, due process for users. Uh, so I just wanted to emphasize these, uh, these aspects of, uh, of the report. But otherwise, yes, I um, very much support uh, everything that's been said. It's a very tricky issue, no silver bullets. I think there's many more discussions to be had, including in relation to looking at behaviors and manipulation because you know we always get into difficult questions about definitions and what it means and the impact that this can have on campaigners for instance because um, even when looking just at behavior sometimes um, article as an organization at article 19 that's something that we've seen sometimes is just really engaging with all the different actors to try and look at the possible uh, intended unintended consequences of various approaches Thank you very much. Um, Alexander Alexandrovich, would you like to prove at anything? Позвольте, да, реплику. Спасибо большое. Я, собственно, поддержу докладчиков предыдущих, да. Именно нужен комплексный подход, и здесь никакого одного универсального средства не существует. Вот с точки зрения теории безопасности, здесь, с одной стороны, нужен комплекс мер по борьбе с самими угрозами, а с другой стороны комплекс мер, направленный на повышение а, вот, жизнестойкости самих объектов воздействия, там, дезинформации, фейковых новостей и так далее. А, вот а, очень интересная статья несколько лет назад была опубликована в журнале Foreign Affairs по поводу а, дипфейков, и она заканчивается таким мрачным пророчеством а, – который звучит примерно так, чтобы выжить в условиях угрозы глубоких фейков, людям необходимо научиться жить в мире лжи. Вот, к сожалению, да, навыки по выживанию вот в условиях мира лжи, они критически важны, да, и вот формирование этих навыков в рамках медиаграмотности является чрезвычайно важным. Спасибо. Thank you, but maybe also like with, with the world of COVID, we'll be able to find a vaccine, a vaccine at some point. <laughs> but um, thank you very much all the speakers uh, for your uh, wise presentations and uh, uh, for again, raising awareness of the topic and, and, and the practical steps that uh, you all make. And uh, hopefully that will also help not just your work, but our cooperation uh, of different intergovernmental organizations in this field. Uh, we have no minutes left, but uh, uh, according to the, uh, to the watch, according to the clock, but uh, I, I, I will pass the floor to uh, the uh, OSC representative for the freedom of the media for a very few final remarks, please. <laughs> okay. So uh, first of all, thank you, thank you all. It was a very, very interesting discussion. To tell you the truth, I was not supposed to stay for the whole uh, for the whole uh, meeting, but uh, you know it was so interesting that I decided to. So uh, once again, it was very interesting also to, that you pointed that no silver bullet. That is a very, very complex issue. 
um, and we need to continue to discuss it. Uh, at the various levels, that's true. Uh, it's, uh, it's a multilateral issue. Uh, it must be central uh, in, uh, in our discussions because of the different, uh, uh, different dimensions uh, involved. Uh, and that is what we'll continue to do, uh, to discuss it, uh, because uh, not only there is no silver bullet, but the question is evolving. The, it's an issue in constant uh, evolution. So uh, we need to keep talking. Thank you very much once again, and see you soon uh, in our next uh, uh, webinars on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and uh, let's try to relax during the weekend. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.